Um, hello, everybody. My name is Mark Nutter. I'm the Conservation Program Director here at New Hampshire Audubon. I'd first like to acknowledge that this presentation is streaming to you from our state headquarters in Concord, New Hampshire, which is located within the site of the ancient village of Penacook in Nadakina, which is the traditional ancestral homeland and waterways of the of the Abenaki, Penacook, and Wabanaki peoples past and present. I'd like to acknowledge and honor with gratitude the land and waterways and our ancestors, the Alnumbach, or human beings, who have stewarded Nadakina throughout the generations for thousands of years. New Hampshire Audubon is honored to continue the stewardship of these lands, providing opportunities for all peoples to form connections to the natural world. And I invite you to learn more about the indigenous presence on the land you occupy by visiting the website native-land.ca. Here you can explore and click on territories of indigenous peoples and get connected to resources to learn more. And for a more in-depth understanding of the Granite State, check out all the educational resources at indigenousnh.com, including this interactive story map that details the indigenous presence and their stories here in New Hampshire. These resources, among others, have helped me recognize the ongoing consequences of colonialism for all people of color and the need for change in our current society. And thank you again for your interest in tonight's topic, Beauty and Reciprocity, presented by Alice B. Fogel, a past New Hampshire Poet Laureate. I am looking forward to exploring this topic alongside you this evening. And as you may know, this talk is the 14th session of a year-long webinar series called Exploring Connections to and Stewardship of the Natural World, which is supported by a New Hampshire Humanities Council grant. The past recordings of these excellent talks can be found on the New Hampshire Audubon YouTube page, which are also linked on the series webpage. Throughout the series, we are exploring the intersection of the sciences and the humanities, finding and forging new ways to connect with nature and learn about the importance of conservation action. So I want to invite you to really take the time and space to consider how tonight's topic informs, strengthens, or otherwise supports how you define yourself as a person and how you connect with human communities as well as the wild ones. I implore you to reflect on why this topic is important to you and your personal value system and how you can connect with others through this topic in your daily life. And before I hand it over to Diane to introduce tonight's presenter, I'd like to take this opportunity to briefly describe how this webinar fits into the larger mission of New Hampshire Audubon. So for those of you who don't know, New Hampshire Audubon is a state-based environmental nonprofit organization that's completely independent from National Audubon. We rely on members and donors like you to support our charitable mission, which has four programmatic pillars, connecting people to nature through environmental education experiences like school programs, nature day camp, and webinars like these, researching and conserving species in peril, including large raptors and small birds, managing about 10,000 acres of wildlife sanctuaries throughout the state for habitat and recreation. And finally, advocating for sound environmental policy here in the New Hampshire State Legislature. I am here today because of donors and members like you. We also rely on a huge network of, network of volunteers that assist us with wildlife monitoring, ambassador animal care, environmental education, and wildlife sanctuary management throughout the state. If you are a volunteer member or supporter of New Hampshire Audubon, I would like to sincerely thank you. We simply couldn't achieve our charitable mission without you. And if you'd like to become a part of our conservation family uh, today, which I hope you will, please check out our website for ways to get involved. And I'll throw some links into the chat in, uh, in a little bit. We have about 15 people registered for this evening's talk and a few more um, streaming in through Facebook Live. Um, so you'll see right now we're in full webinar mode. Um, this might change over to a meeting, uh, or we can promote you to uh, an attendee uh, to uh, ask your question live. And we'll welcome discussion uh, at, at logical points throughout the presentation. So feel free to use the chat for any thoughts, comments, or reactions you might have uh, during the presentation. And this, the Q&A specific button for any questions that you would like answered by Alice. It's been great to see the vast geographies we've been able to reach through these webinars. So for fun, feel free to type into the chat where you're watching the presentation from. I wanna give a quick, out, uh, quick shout out to Diane DeLuca, 
uh, who is the senior biologist at New Hampshire Audubon responsible for orchestrating this series. Without her leadership and coordination, this webinar series, which is by far the largest event series I've ever been a part of, uh, would simply not ha happen. So thank you so much, Diane, um, and thank you for being here tonight. Um, and so tonight, Diane and I will be monitoring both the Q&A here in Zoom and Facebook Live. And uh, like I said, we'll take questions and prompt discussion um, throughout the presentation. So without further ado, I'd like to hand it over to Diane to introduce this evening's presenter. Thanks, Mark. And I'm going to just throw it back to Mark, a big thank you, because it wouldn't happen. This webinar series would not happen without Mark either. So um, really um, very grateful to be on a team with him. So tonight, and I'd also like to thank Alice for being with us tonight. So Alice B. Fogel is the previous New Hampshire Poet Laureate from 2014 to 2019. She's the author of five poetry collections, including Interval, poems based on Bach's Goldberg variations, which won the N. Schaffner Award for Music and Literature and the New Hampshire Literary Award. Another poetry book is due out around the end of 2021. And she is also the author of Strange Terrain on how to appreciate poetry without necessarily getting it, in quotes. Among other awards, Alice has been given a fellowship from the National Endowment for the Arts, and her poems have appeared in many journals and anthologies, including Best American Poetry. She teaches reading and writing workshops in a wide range of areas, works one-on-one -on -one with students with learning dif differences at Landmark College, and hikes mountains whenever possible. Tonight, Alice is going to share a presentation that she's titled Beauty and Reciprocity. And she describes it as follows. Like many of us who experience biophilia, when it comes to our most existential lifeline, the natural world, I exist in a personal and anthropogenic dissonance of celebration and mourning, vision and blindness. I want to explore these tensions and the questions they raise about reciprocity through the topic of beauty. Why do we find other life in geological forms so compelling and yet not sufficiently connect their survival with our own? What does nature's beauty have to do with us and us with it? This presentation is from the viewpoint of a poet, not a scientist, who is attempting to go more deeply into her intertwined senses of wonder at what we are given and grief at what we are losing and find some beauty there. So we're very excited to have Alice and thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks for that nice introduction. And I'm really happy to be doing something with um, the New Hampshire Audubon. Um, I thought I would just start with a poem. Um, I'm gonna read some poems of mine um, and just and talk about my progression as a as a writer um, connected to nature my whole life. But I'm starting with a poem by Hattie Ann Rogers. She's an American poet who um, pays a lot of attention to nature, particularly plants, but, but in general. And um, she is just a great observer and gives us so, gives us another way of seeing through her eyes. So this particular poem is called The Creation of the Inaudible. Maybe no one can distinguish which voice is God's voice sounding in a summer dusk because he calls with the same rising frequency, the same rasp and rattling rustle the cicadas use as they cling to the high leaves in the glowing dust of the oaks. His exclamations might blend so precisely with the final crises of the swallows settling before dark that no one will ever be able to say with certainty that last long cry winging over the rooftop came from God. Breathy and low, the vibrations of his nightly incantations could easily be masked by the scarcely audible hush of the lake line dealing with a rocky shore. And when a thousand dry sheaves of rushes and thistles 
stiffen and shiver in an autumn wind. Anyone can imagine how quickly and irretrievably his whisper might be lost. Someone far away must be saying right now, the only unique sound of his being is the spoken postulation of his unheard presence. For even if he found the perfect chant this morning, and even if he played the perfect strings to accompany it, still no one could be expected to know because the blind click beetle flipping in midair and the slider turtle easing through the black iris bog and two savanna pines shedding dawn in staccato pieces of falling sun are, are already engaged in performing the very same arrangement themselves. I don't think that it matters, uh, at least I hope not, um, whether you believe in God or not. And interestingly, she doesn't capitalize the word God. Um, what she's trying to say, I think, is that the holy is in all of those sounds and all of those um, movements in nature around us. And um, we can't separate them at all. Um, if you're interested in responding to that, please go ahead and write that in the chat. Um, so I'll introduce myself a little bit in my past and how I came to writing and how I came to be so in love with the nature around me. Um, I grew up in a small town in the Hudson Valley in New York State. Um, and um, spent a lot of time outside. I walked a lot. I had a lot of freedom to explore the woods. I grew up on the Croton River, which I could walk to. And um, it enters into the Hudson right, right there where I grew up. Um, so there's an aqueduct road I used to walk on all the time. It was one of the really old um, colonial roads that connected um, the water systems through New York State, through the eastern side of New York State. Um, I pretty much had poison ivy my entire life from the time I was about six to maybe 16 or so back then. Um, it was just impossible to avoid. Um, I'm going to, you know, jump to the present for just a second to give you a sense of, of me. Um, yesterday, I cleaned all of my kitchen window sills and the windows. Um, there are five nice windows. And most of what that cleaning entails is taking all of my little nature tchotchkes down off of the window sills and cleaning them and then cleaning the sills and then putting them back. I have a really hard time separating the indoors from the outside. And so all over my house are feathers, wings, spiders, webs, um, rocks, shells, pine cones, pieces of wood, lots of rocks and stones from all over the world, um, <clears throat> plants, as you can see behind me here. Um, <clears throat> they're they're everywhere and I really like keeping the doors open. I really have a hard time closing the doors even in the winter. Um, I feel like the outdoors is part of my house and um, I take it all inside with me. Um, so even as a kid, I felt myself as a recipient of the nature around me the fog that lifted off the Croton River and came and covered the view from my house every morning. And then it would lift up so that then I could see through to the mountains on the other side of the Hudson. Um, just felt so alive to me. And maybe because I grew up on this um, ancient path, which had been a native 
path before it became used by the colonialists. Um, uh, it felt to me like I was part of time, part of geologic time, ancient footsteps of people and animals had walked exactly where I was. And if somehow I could um, just sit there quietly, I would hear not just the stream coming down into the river, but I could hear those footsteps somehow in the grasses, along with the bees buzzing and the butterflies around me. Um, so being when I talk about reciprocity, I'm thinking not just how much I take in and how much I gain from the natural world around me, but what are they getting from us? What is their sense of our presence? Are they aware that there's somebody walking by them or, or touching them? And can they sense um, our attention and our um, feelings for them? I think my absolute favorite thing to say is we have no idea. And if I ever have a headstone, that's what I want on my headstone. We have no idea. And little by little, we are learning so much more that we have no idea about just the little bits of it. We're learning about how um, plants behave and respond to their to the environment. We're learning about how animals um, communicate. We're learning about how fungi communicate with trees. Um, there are so many things that are just beyond where we, what we have traditionally thought about the human world interacting. So I'm curious about, about that reciprocity. Um, so my first few books of poems were definitely something you could call nature poetry. They were lyrical. They got almost all their images from the outdoors, from my encounters with wildlife and um, in natural settings or whatever was the most natural that I could find at the, at the times when I was there. Um, and I will I'll read you some, but I also think that in those days, a lot of the times that I was writing about nature, I was really writing about human nature and how we can see ourselves in nature, how um, the things that happen in the natural world happen in us or help us understand ourselves better. I have mixed feelings about seeing nature that way. I think it's really instructive and it's part of our reciprocity, but I also feel that it's very uh, human centric and I um, am not sure it's the best way to go at being an observer and a participant in the natural world. Um, but it's been a timeline for me of different ways of connecting. Um, so I'm going to read a poem from my first book, which was called Elemental. Let's see if you can see that beautiful painting. So this is a poem for autumn. Um, I always felt like people see the fall as a sad time because things are dying. And so the autumn of your life is before the winter of your life, which is probably when you die. Um, so, um, so there's this, that's part of our um, connecting on a you know, human centric way with nature. Um, it's, we, we connect with nature in so many ways that we're barely conscious of, not just what's the weather today. So I know whether I need an umbrella or a coat, but um, so many, archetypal, imagistic ways, we don't separate ourselves from nature. But I consciously thought about that attitude about the autumn, and it actually is my favorite season. So um, this poem takes a different attitude about, about those changes happening. <clears throat> it's called Always Moving. 
Oh, the intemperate pulse and dance of these seasons, so in love, moment to moment moving, free of holds and wholly held, unattached and so a part of belonging. Summer's scent unhinged and set to traveling, sent afar by wind. Laughter, listen, those nomad pourings, those petaled, sorry, those nomad moorings, those petaled pourings of morning storms. Autumn, passionate, impatient, is speaking of space invisible, divisible, defined by what is past, what present. This is the weather pouring over us in the ecstasy of its unpredictable piety. October, November, what a way to awaken. Suddenly I know how it is that the leaves from sheer beauty can dash themselves to earth. So wonderful in how it moves, always in how moving is the world. So in, in the poems in that first book, there's so much about, um, about the natural world and about weather and um, you know, snowstorms, wind, seasons, leaves, fields, time. All of these are also about relationships. Like all of, our, all of my relationships could be described as these things, a snowstorm, <laughs> wind, the different seasons what's going on with leaves at that time. Um, a poem about wintering is about depression. A poem called The White and Frozen Place about walking across a frozen lake is about hardship. Um, one called Fireflies was about unlived lives. Um, there was one called Particulars, which is about a sunset casting a long shadow eastward. And that's about a long distance love. So you can see that like in every way that I thought about my life, I could represent it by looking at nature around me or vice versa. Um, there's still some of that, that happening in my second book, um, which was called, I Love This Dark World. That was a quote from my oldest son when he was about two, um, two and maybe three months and he was sitting outside at dusk for the first time, just sitting out there and um, watching as the world got dark, something that he'd really probably never taken in in such an aware way. And um, he began to look really sad and I wasn't sure what was going on with him and whether he was all right. And so I asked him what he was thinking and he said, I love this dark world. It's such a beautiful thing to hear from a two-year-old. He was enchanted and just and trans transported, I think. So that's where the book got its title from. And of course, when we think about a dark world, we think about the heaviness of the hard things going on in the world around us. But it's also nighttime. And there's so much beauty in nighttime and so much life and action going on in the dark world. Um, so the poem I'm gonna read from that book is called Instead. And it came from a little bit of scientific information which often triggers poems for me um, about the 30,000 eyes that a dragonfly has. And um, it just made me wonder, wow, what could we see if we had 30,000 eye units to perceive the world with? So, all right, it's called Instead. Where I see nothing, instead, the dragonfly sees its own flight the waves its wings throw through the atmosphere above the pond. June, sunlight jewels its 30,000 eyes, whole worlds possible 
in each one. The dragonfly seizes the air, every molecule an object of mercy or reckoning. Water seethes in the air's embrace, condensing, evaporating between pond and sky, between eye and eye. The dragonfly, mythical, simple, weightless pegasus, sees the throb in the throat of humidity, the expansion of atoms, suspension bridges spanning every hue. Think of the refraction, think of prisms, how the dragonfly hovers between rays thick as mirrors, conspicuous as neon, finds its path through forests invisible to me in one square inch of light, witnesses the air as it flies up into futures, blue or cloud, or falls back to the pond, still cold from the spring. The dragonfly rides the train of tomorrow's rain down the rails to a taste of blackfly. The waltz, the hunt, the loom, the dragonfly's ancestral dance, and the weave of actual time and physical space. There is so much that I don't know. The dragonfly knows ash and dust, pollen, insect, seed and scent, light, lightness, shadow, shape, the lift and swoop and race of wings, last year's disintegration, next century's tree. Tonight, I could look up into a summer's night and see there this life before it existed and after and instead. Um, I think I'm gonna skip over um, one or two of, I was going to kind of do one from each book, but I'm going to skip over the next one. The next book is called Be That Empty, um, which comes from a Rumi poem about the flute. Um, and in that poem, that book is all about air. It's um, all the things that go on in the air that we're not aware of. You know, we, we think of air as just being this kind of emptiness. And I'm thinking, wow, we should all be that empty. There is just so much going on in the air. If we have time, I might come back um, to that. So after those three books, I, um, even though I still was outside as much as I could be, I felt that as a writer, I needed to try to um, do something more challenging and change it up for myself um, and not just be focusing on nature. Um, so I wrote um, a few books that had very different intentions. The next one is called um, it's called Interval, and it's poems based on Box Goldberg variations and the theme of embodiment and spirit that music really um, upholds. Um, but of course, me being me nature sneaks in there all the time anyway. Um, and um, I just really like to be able to, um, to look outside and, and observe things and think of the music involved just in the actions of the natural world around me. So um, in this poem, which is, um, using the 11th variation in the box, Goldberg variation. Um, it's called Reflection. And it is um, kind of from, from the voice of maybe someone between the layers of, of reality that, that we experience. And so it's, um, but it's located on a lake in a canoe um, under the moon. If you've ever been in a canoe at night or a kayak and you see where the moon, how the moon shines down, it looks like it's, it's look like, it looks like you can see it 
go down into the depths of the lake. It also looks like it's coming at you no matter where you are. If you turn the kayak or the canoe, the, the moonlight is always coming at you. It's a really interesting phenomenon. Um, so this is about the depth of the water and the moonlight reflection. Out in the center, canoe and you, no cause for interruption, only wingless here while hovering. Deep into waters overlaps, the moon's fractures fold and flow, flow and fold and fracture. Look down long enough, out here on the lake, afloat, surrounded by and on the dark lap, lapping, the long wet folded fan moon, stippled length of twine moon, broken linked moon hanging its white chains down, a zip down into depths only visible horizontally, and all that dripped thick liquid ellipsis seems its own true form. Pierced by lunar rays, by turns, the ponderous bass diminish and flash, bleeding upward from beneath into the gleam and reach of lit glissando, opaque, steady, Above all, the cool sky scoops all that soaked, unskeined light up into one flat coin, one disc like a wrist flicked stone you once skimmed like this from shore that left no trail of white. Fixed, dry, nearly untouched, still that full moon pulled down here across the waving layers of slick lake slapping and licking the gunnels skips downwards through and through illuminating waters buried and drowned ground by roofs. I think that um, you can see how much everything that I see um, the, there's like this intensity of, of taking in um, all of the, the vision of all of that. And, and there's all, there's, you know, reflections are kind of mystical anyway, just in themselves, the way that we see um, something opposite, you know, you see a lake and it has clouds in it. Um, even though the clouds are in the sky, that's how we, how we see it. Um, so, um, so there's so much around us. And to me, that is poetry, this mystery. It's, a, it's about something that you can't totally grasp. Even if you knew all the scientific information about it, there's still this sense of wonder, why? Why is it like that? Why is it so beautiful? Can we you know, even explain it? We can study Darwin, we can learn all of the facts, we can analyze and diagram, um, just as music is nothing but a pattern of mathematical durations and intervals, and yet it affects us on this incredibly emotional level. But nature is like that too. Um, love is like that. God is like that if you, if you have a belief and faith in God. And these are things that don't fit with what most of our language of commerce um, uses. And we need a different kind of language. We need the language of poetry and we need language that isn't even words like um, music and like raindrops on leaves. We need to take those in and remember those, um, those other elements of what it means to be alive here on this planet. Um, I'm going to read one more poem um, from, from my books and then um, talk a little bit more about beauty and what I'm working on now. Um, so uh, my latest book just came out actually this week. It's called Nothing But. And it's, um, it's all poems that are responding to 
pieces of abstract expressionist art, which also fit that category of wonder. And um, it's what, what inspires me about abstract expressionism is that you look at it and you can't say, oh, that is a, that is a mountain, that's a lake, that's a person, a table. You, you, you look at it and your mind just goes into a stop for a moment, um, almost like a huh kind of moment. And I love having that experience. I love interrupting my stream of consciousness and just taking in what I'm seeing. It's texture, it's color, light, um, pigment affecting light, light affecting pigment, and then it's affecting me as I take it in. So I, I feel that while people say that um, abstract expressionist art is non-representational, it is representa representational of, of something. It's um, representing maybe the cosmos, maybe the depths of water in a lake. Um, it's it's representing texture, maybe the bark of a tree. If you just look at that without the context of the tree and the forest that represents something. Um, and that's what that art is, is letting us experience. Um, there's this beautiful painting on the cover. Let me see if I can put this. Um, here we go. Um, some people look at it and they see like a nebula or something out in space. Some people see water and they look at it, um, color. Um, it's by Robin Tedesco. And um, each, of the, each of the poems responds to a different painting, which, and I list the artists in, in the back. Um, and so there's a lot about it, consciousness in here and a lot about, um, what we perceive as beauty or what we understand or don't understand. Um, and I'm just gonna read one of these poems because it's kind of about time in the world and what, how we participate in creating the world. It's called Inspiration. Plainly, without pre presentiment, herds of buffalo cleared our first roads stamped into underlayment, grass and stone, and made for us those shining sashes of lack of what there otherwise was, as all that isn't love is a lack of love. Without compromise, we followed, as if stepping with our own sweet feet, laid a descant over ground, a gloss on matters of time and space, and vow at the crossroads of now and then, we long to balance on the variance of winds sounding their crux in every canyon between us, and still cast a credulous eye over the brink. Absence is a kind of annotation, a route we can't agree upon, but we can take along some measure of compassion by knife, on foot, in wishful intention to get somewhere. We carve markings of our world into the markings of the world. I'm gonna just pause for a minute and just see if there's any questions that Mark or Diane are seeing coming in before I move into my present project on, on nature and beauty. Is there anything that... Um... I just have a couple comments um, that I'll relate from Facebook Live and, uh, and then Diane can read the, the other one that I see here in the chat. But from Facebook, um, one person says, beautiful poetry, thanks to Alice for presenting as well as, wow, that's fantastic. And I think that was, um, one of the first poems that you recited. Thank you. Okay. Um, so now at 
this time in my life, my kids are grown up. I have lots more freedom. I mean, I still have a job, but I still have a lot of freedom. And um, I do a lot of hiking. After my daughter graduated from high school, I, like the next week, I set out uh, on a three-week backpacking trip on the Appalachian Trail, which I have now covered about a thousand miles of. I don't know if I'll ever do the whole thing, but um, I would love to. And I also really love going to national parks, state parks, um, local backwoods, you know, snowmobile trails, any kind of trails. Um, so I do a lot of that. I also do a lot of kayaking. Um, on Saturday, I went kayaking on Sand Pond in Marlow, and I played with the loons there. There were loons um, just singing at the top of their lungs. <laughs> it was just awesome. Um, I also read a lot about nature. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about this term biophilia that um, I think came from Edward Abbey. Um, this love of things in nature and how, and how we're programmed in some way to find things beautiful um, around us, you know, butterflies and flowers, like what is it in us that, that has that experience? And yet why do we also not turn that into a sense of responsibility and stewardship? How can we be so blind and so destructive of the um, very things that feed us either emotionally or literally, um, and what are we doing? So that's where I feel that there's this dissonance. And I think that we're all experiencing that dissonance. And you know, after this summer of fires and floods and droughts um, and the worst storms, that it's becoming less possible to avoid thinking about about what's going on on our planet. It's, um, it's very abstract to think about plants and animals in a jungle on another continent going extinct, but it's not abstract when you have to abandon your house because of floods and, um, and mud filling up your, your home. So, um, what does that bring us to? There's the dis the dissonance is how much we love and need the balance of nature and how much we are causing suffering for it and ourselves. So we, um, I feel like um, by writing about nature now, I'm celebrating it very consciously, almost like, almost like, um, desperately i'm desperately celebrating what we have and i'm trying to just pick one thing at a time one plant one animal one rock formation one weather pattern and and celebrate it and yet i cannot avoid mourning the possible loss that is happening at this at the same time i think some of us are suffering from that um, whether consciously or not, some consciously, most of us, maybe subconsciously, knowing that um, that trouble is is brewing, we are in trouble. Um, so I've decided to really consciously write poems that I'm, um, and I'm spending a lot of time trying to learn the science behind the, these specific things. Um, to the extent that I can, to really try to see more about um, about them. And I feel like, you know, while lyric nature poetry is important and beautiful, it doesn't have the innocence to it that it once did. It's no longer possible to write about nature that innocently because while we connect everything in our lives to nature, we need to be consciously paying attention. We need to know who our partners are in this world. 
and what we're doing to them and also what they offer to us. Um, because there are so many creatures, rocks, trees, um, you know, living and not living things that actually protect us, that can actually do a lot to you know, absorb carbon dioxide and store it, um, to lessen floods. But we do these really idiotic things. We build our houses in floodplains. We cut down massive acreages of trees. Um, we're, you know, we're basically cutting off our nose to spite your face, or how, however that saying goes. Um, so, loving nature now is tinged with grief and warning about loss and greed. Um, so let me read, I'm going to actually share, um, I'm going to find this poem, give me a second. Um, okay. Let me share my screen and hopefully you'll see this poem. So um, I've been trying to find quotes that go with my subjects. Um, this poem is about a lily called Fritillaria della Valle. And I found these two quotes. <clears throat> Rumi's quote is, lilies make the best lilies, which I think is really, really brilliant and so useful in so many places, you know, like you could just say that to your three-year-old, you know, <laughs> lilies make the best lilies. Um, and there's irony in it that he might not have predicted. And so is there in Krishnamurti's uh, quote here, a lily never pretends and its beauty is that it is what it is. And there's definitely irony in that, which you'll see in this poem about, about this plant. At what cost <clears throat> to the plant, its decision finally to change? Had it been happy with its old golden green? Its petaled bell tilts downward, observing the ground rust sunset tinted dun a shiny charcoal gray the shades of shale and pebbled alpine soil it tucks itself between it took five years to grow its first flower and that will be the only flower this year on its slopes it cups the sounds of sharp rocks shifting and clicking against one another under the steps of hunters who cut away the root, the soil, the stem, and the flower, and dry the bulb, scaly and conchoidal, in the cool sun of an autumn day. It costs so little to collect and gets a good price, this medicine that soothes a cough and moistens lungs, chills a fever and calms a human inflammation. The lily, like animals who disrupt their own coloration, who mimic for safety what's of no interest, like plants who dust themselves in sand disguises or falsify their edges to hide, who paint on their surfaces illusions of depth and shadow, all the better to survive, remixes pigments and turns brown and gray and dull to masquerade as stone. At all costs, in its own defense, it will surrender its bright and beautiful natural color, lose itself to fool the hands that want it, live longer among the mountain rubble that shelters it, blending in till nearly invisible while still in sight they are in the light of day. So I hope that the story is coming through in that, but there, so there's this plant that 
um, it grows in a certain mountain range in China and it's used for a kind of medicine. But um, so people go out and they collect it just to use the bulb, um, which they prepare. Um, and in the places, so this like defying everything we think we know about evolution and time, um, it has been observed that these flowers in a generation, which is, you know, a season basically, are changing their color to blend in with the rocks, the shale that they grow amongst. And the ones that are in the areas that are most getting the most hunting are changing quicker than the others. They are, you know, they're changing their color to blend in and try to survive. This is an example of we have no idea. <laughs> you know, this is, um, you know, how is this a conscious decision? Is this, um, what does that even mean? What is plant consciousness? We know that that microbes respond to other microbes being killed. Um, and how do we understand that? How do we know what, you know, is there a mind? Is something going on in a mind here? Or is there some other level of perception that is so much more complex than we even really um, know how to think about? You know, they do say we only use about 3% of our brains, right? So how do we know what else is going on in, in possible brains or whatever aspects of um, reality in the rest of the natural world we are part of and that's a simple example of that um i have been uh, applying for some grants and um to to work on this project and um i'd like to read for you some of what i wrote um i think i'm going to stop sharing this screen for a moment Um, to try to describe, you know, what what I'm trying to do. Um, all right, so the project is built around scientific research and current news articles about specific animals, plants, geological formations, cosmic phenomena, weather, and electromagnetic forces by delving into and beyond personal encounters with flora, fauna, and landscape, and into the science, I gain vocabulary and facts to scaffold the language and imagery of poems and synthesize the essential vitality and time-sensitive connections that these things have to each other and to us. While the whole of this devotional expresses celebration and grieving, wonder and warning, individual poems can't help but cast shadows, even as their illumination is built of awe-evoking details about some of our companion presences. These poems are meant to be like snapshots or specimens, a form of attention, preservation, and plea. Particular poems describe capacities that can seem almost unimaginable. The mantis shrimp's ability to see frequencies in water, more color than we can conceive of. Microorganisms' reactions to the deaths of others. Green bean vines' intentional searching out and reaching for structures to climb. The speed at which celestial bodies are moving away from every other object in the universe at about 10,000 kilometers per section per second, the actions of lava, sand, and soil. Although we abuse them, the natural world's entities, both alive and inert, take care of unrelated species, not least of all us. Our environmental existential needs and offerings are naturally inextricably interconnected. Periditite is a kind of stone that sequesters carbon dioxide gas in rock by mineralizing it. Gnats eat toxic algae. Blood red worms reduce hydrosulfide. Oyster shells form natural shoreline barriers. And yet, as every sane person must know, after dec decades of enforced denial, climate change, mass migration, 
habitat destruction and species demise are rampant. So these facts obviously are not news to you, but I'm thinking that maybe they're the extent, the shocking extent to which these things are happening could be taken in more readily to what's what we poets call this terrible specificity of detail. Looking at one um, creature at a time. Um, I want to ask you, do I have time to read one more poem? OK. Um, Let's see. I could read about the mantis shrimp. I think I'll actually read a poem about beauty. So let me get back to that. Right. So this is one where I'm really thinking about the um, aspects of beauty itself. And the quote is from Will William Bryant Logan, who wrote this absolutely spiritual page turner called Dirt. It's just an awesome book about dirt and soil. Um, and he is just so exuberant in his absolute love for, for it. And his quote is, beauty is the vocation of the world. And that's from a guy who spends a lot of time looking at worms. What is the purpose of beauty, which is, after all, in everything, from lip to leaf, from the run of a jaguar to the flash of fall, bittersweet berries on a vine? We like to think we're so evolved but beauty flames everywhere we look or don't even think to look. Extremophiles alive in caves deep in the sea, the texture of moths, forest sedges sprayed with rain. Is there beauty and our seeing it all by accident, by chance, by change that echoes down millennia across continent and range from wonder at the tender to surprise by the strange. What is beauty for, even when it isn't advantageous? The lift of lichen off stone, the ribbons of the squid, flashes of phosphorescence on waves. Was it made for pleasing us or because it pleases another or even the beautiful themselves? But we are them tied just the same to chance and change, at times heavy and, alter and alternately buoyed by the same desire to choose what attracts, to sketch our own design, to favor form, render with pattern and color. Even when it burdens us, antlers and tails too great a weight to bear, even if it risks the wrong attention, the danger, the chase, the clash. Still, it is not vanity, but joy to affect difference, to be, to become, to dare, to be seen. Darwin says sexual selection, and we grow into our own kind of hair, our skin, the features on each face. Next, humans embellish, enhance, do to ourselves little that other species don't also do besides destroy, make ideals out of variation and mimicry, borrow or steal the feathers and fur, the silk, the accent, the wing. Then we say I and you or this and that, say look and touch or even hate and kill. We sing and yearn, strut, mirror, repel, we can help ourselves neither to compare nor conjoin. Meanwhile, the honeybee remembers the flower, its particular shape and palette, its signature scent, 
and returns. Again and yet again, they share the nectar and what's for one sake is for the sake of the other and also for us, the we who watch, decorate and eat from that garden and peer through the fence into yours. What if beauty's existence feeds a hunger for beauty? What if what we miss is the purpose of ourselves, the covenant given us to care, to treasure, and protect each other in all our beauties, our similarities and contrasts? Beauty could be the cause and the source of knowledge and its shadow, ignorance, the curse and the blessing of identity we are born to, the root of want, of sorrow, fear, or even love. So um, I guess I would just um, kind of end on just um, thinking about that I, I really want to record the generosities of the natural world around me. And, and I mean, I've thought a lot about what can I do? Um, I'm not a really great organizer. I'm not that public a person, but I write and maybe I can use that. I think we can all connect in the ways that feel the most natural to us and do the work that we um, can. Um, and that's, that's what I'm trying to do here to, to look at all of these questions. Um, and I guess if you're interested in um, having any discussion or responding to some questions, I would start by just asking, does beauty have a purpose and what might that be? And do are other creatures or plants or even geological formations suffused with some sense of beauty themselves, or is it a projection of ours? Maybe it's not fair to leave with a question instead, <laughs> instead of a statement, you know, a conclusion. But, um, I'll Alice, Alice, Donna actually, um, sent a, a quite an interesting question and I had the same one. Do you write with pen and pad outdoors and jot down lines when you are in nature? Um, thanks for asking that. I always do have um, a little pencil stub and paper with me and I often will just write down a quick image. I take a lot of pictures too. I'm like, you know, it's really embarrassing how many pictures I take, um, but I don't, it's, I'm not exactly, you know, I'm not sitting down and trying to write a poem because I really just want to be where I am. Um, but I take all that home and then kind of relive it and, mm -hmm. and work on it then. And I'd just like to say thank you. And I really appreciate your perspective of, you know, doing what you can to help solve this ginormous slew of problems, that, environmental problems that we're facing as a society. And um, I think that is a great way to connect with people that I think we're starting to learn at New Hampshire Audubon is, you know, we talk science and people who also talk science like get us, but there's this whole other part of the human population that doesn't connect in that way and needs um, a different medium to convey the meanings and the messages. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious um, if you've either written or are, are considering written, writing about um, rare and endangered species that um, make New Hampshire their home or New England as, as a whole? You know, that's a really, that's a really good thought. I've been really just responding to anything that I see. Like, you know, I just learned about two species that were thought extinct already. One is a bird in Borneo and one was a, a particular kind of bee in Australia and they've just found them after not having seen them for a hundred years. Mm. But but the irony in that is that now they actually really 
are likely to go extinct because their environments are being so, you know, diminished. And, um, but I would, you know, send me anything, <laughs> send me, <laughs> send me things, and I would be happy to focus on New Hampshire in, in as many ways as possible. Cool. We'll, we'll definitely uh, send, send you some ideas uh, that our, our scientists are working on, you know, small birds and even larger raptors. Um, uh -huh. that, that some are really flashy, but others are like, what's a rusty blackbird and why is it important? And without, you know, telling their story, um, they're also at risk um, to be lost. I really like the ones that are not flashy. <laughs> <laughs> Those are, you know, um, those are really good to think about. So, so I'll, Alice, I'll just share that I connected to a lot of things, starting with cleaning my kitchen windows and having the inside, the outside inside, which is definitely my house as well. Um, but I think I'm a biologist at Audubon and I, Obviously, I'm looking at things through a different lens, but I really connected to the your thoughts on we have no idea. And it took me right to Monarchs that I was just working on um, Friday and Saturday because we have no idea. How do they know how to migrate 3,000 miles, you know, down into Mexico to one particular spot? Mm -hmm. And these monarchs have just hatched and they're making this migration. There are just so many mysteries. And I think even as scientists, you love to hold on to those mysteries. Mm -hmm. I don't feel like we should know all the answers. I feel that that's the wonder and that's what draws us and gives us passion about the natural world. So mm -hmm. I really appreciated listening to you tonight and had a lot of connections, um, even though I'm a terrible poet. I must admit, I wish I could do that, but, but as a scientist, much, you know, I, there's a lot to connect to. I benefit from the work that other people do that I don't do. And we, and I also need people to care about poetry who aren't necessarily writing it. So we need each other in, in that way, symbiotic. You know? And Alice, do you have any ha habits that you'd recommend um, for uh, getting started into poetry, you know. Any, any what did you say? Any uh, writing exercises or, or or prompts that you you'd recommend, especially for our audience that are are more along the the scientist lens, because as you mentioned, there it's a lot the same of observation, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's there's so much the same, and I, I guess that's where I would start on you know to do and do to do some kind of writing exercise to just start, I would go outside and just look and listen and feel and write down one observation. Just, mm -hmm. you know, it could be a word or phrase or you could go on for a page. Um, just write that down and just try to stay really in the concrete mm -hmm. um, and then take it inside and and find the abstract element of emotion that mm. um, that connects for you with with that thing. Um, but then, but come back to the image. So, so the emotion gets embodied, but we really are getting it through the through the imagery. Mm. Thank you. I'll I'll, try, I'll have to try that. <laughs> Alice Patricia on, on Facebook wrote um, a beautiful sentiment to you. Thank you, Alice. Your poems help us to evolve opening minds and hearts and strengthening our intentions through your beautiful language. Thank you. Well, I guess I would say, um, you know, Mark, when you were talking about what um, what helps people connect through the work that you do, um, it's probably 
you know, that very specific thing, you know, you take a kid outside and you say, look at this and mm -hmm. hold this caterpillar in your hand and, and now come in and look at the cocoon that it made, just, you know, like actually being there and seeing that one little thing, you know, I think, I think we have this idea that we need to be like hit over the head with some enormous, you know, flash of lightning and have it be really dramatic to get connected to things, but it's really just the tiniest little thing that can, that can um, change a person's life and mm. direction in life. I love that. And that's what we, we definitely base a lot of our educational philosophy about on at New Hampshire Audubon, which is sparking that, that curiosity and the observation. And really, you can't ask good science questions until you are a good observer and communi can, can communicate those observations to your peers. Um, so yeah, it's definitely uh, overlapping and intertwined. Mm -hmm. The last time I was um, was um, hiking somewhere, in, oh, it was out in one of the national parks in Utah, and I came to a kind of a, a little pond that had a waterfall and it's all these canyons and things around, and there was a class of kids there. They were probably about 10 or 11, just on that verge of starting to be um, really cool. And, um, <laughs> and so most of the well, the boys were, you know, splashing around the pond and throwing, you know, splashing each other and doing the, like throwing things. And there was this one boy who was way over on the side and he was literally crawling through the side of the pond, through the water and like, and poking with his, with his finger, you know, like at something and he was seeing some little insect or something and following it and just was like the least cool person probably in the whole school but i just thought this guy he's that's my guy and he's he's going somewhere he's learning things and he's going to take that somewhere that i want we should all be that guy exactly exactly that reminds me of um an article that i uh, that i read every year and share with whoever would listen but it's a rachel carson piece um that was featured in um, women's home companion and like 1954 and it's all about getting your child to wonder and one of the key takeaways is like if if they know how to identify every single living thing that's like of little use unless they also feel that sense of awe and wonder um with that exploration that connection mm -hmm. yeah Well, thank you so much for hosting me and for creating this entire program. It's just, it's really a wonderful thing. Well, thank you, Alice, um, for uh, all of the inspirational thoughts and readings this evening. Um, really appreciate hearing your perspective uh, on nature and, and how we can all do something. Um, and thank you all for joining us this evening again. Um, and a thanks to the New Hampshire Humanities Council for their support of this series. Um, I'll drop a couple things into the chat. Um, we're interested in hearing your feedback on these um, presentations. So there's a, a feedback form um, and a way to become a member of New Hampshire Audubon. And um, uh, always, we invite you to come to the next webinar. Um, I think it's just next Monday. Uh, no. Next week, this the 28th, in two weeks. Um, and we'll continue about once every couple of weeks um, through the rest of the fall. So thanks again, Alice, for presenting this evening. Thanks to Diane for organizing the series. And thank you for tuning in and um, exploring alongside us. We'll see you at the next webinar. Thanks, Alice. Really appreciate it. Thank you all. Thanks for being here. Thanks.